Okay, so as you have seen, if you see, saw the announcement, the lectures are now going to be on Bruincast, but I strongly encourage you to come in class as well because the lectures are great for reviewing, but coming in class gives you a chance to participate and interact with uh, the demonstrations that we're going to be having and also the problem solving that we're going to be doing in class. So I want everybody to still come but the lectures are there for you to study from as a, as a tool to sort of review. Okay, so today we're talking about magnetic fields. Uh, it's sort of the part two to what we did on Tuesday. We're looking at the magnetic field of a circular current loop and then Ampere's law and applications of that. So to start with, we have this, this uh, current loop so it's a loop of wire where we're essentially have current flowing through this loop and we say we have to figure out what's the magnetic field at a point along this axis here this x-axis and we're going to look at the field in all the different directions because remember with our magnetic field it's a vector field so it's got an x y and z component in general um, so that'll be something that we have to do now so start off by drawing this this magnetic or this current loop so that we can sort of figure out what the magnetic field is going to be by using a little bit of math and geometry. Okay. So we've got this current loop going around like this. Okay. And then the radius of this is just A. Okay. And then we've got some field point out here along from the origin. We can draw a line, call that the x axis. We've got some field point where we're looking at, we're saying, what's the magnetic field right here? as a result of this current flowing. So if it's going in this way, it's got to be going out this way. It's going all the way around. Okay. So then we've got our R hat, which points from any given section DL of this current carrying loop to the field point. So I'm not going to draw this line the whole way there, but you can just think of this vector as pointing to that field point. That's our R hat. And then we've got some sort of magnetic field. They've drawn it here, but we're going to actually figure out what it is first. We're not just going to assume that we know it, but you'll see how that emerges. All right, so we've got our Biot-Savart law which is that we have an infinitesimal bit of magnetic field, dB, comes about when we have current. So we have this constant factor, permeability of free space over 4 pi. Then we've got our current I. Then we've got our dL cross our r hat and then all of that over r squared where r squared r is the magnitude of r r hat okay and we can also use this other form where we know that we're that's going to reduce the the cross product is going to give us idl sine phi where that angle is given in this case, it will be theta, right? We've got a s this angle theta, but theta and phi are used pretty much interchangeably. Okay, so what's R, the magnitude of R, going to be in this case? Well, it's going to be X 
whatever x is plus this a. The a is going to contribute to that. So we're going to have this, we have to do a little bit of, we have to contribute the radius of this to our overall distance there. And then we can write an expression for r squared in terms of that. So we have x plus a, so r is x plus a. So then this becomes x plus a squared. Okay. So then we also have to worry about our components because as I've written it here, this is just true in general for the magnetic field component due to all the x, y, and z contributions. So x plus a squared. This doesn't tell us anything more than that we have some magnetic field and it's, it's going in some direction. To figure out where exactly it's going, we have to do more. And we've got the principle of linear superposition. So we ha we're going to have to sum the contributions from the x, y, and z. Yes, question. Yes, sorry. Should be x squared plus a squared. Yes. And then, yes, yes, we do have to do that there. Sorry. So that's a little bit of a, a typo. Yes. Because we're going to have, right, x squared plus a squared coming from the Pythagorean theorem there. So, yes. Good catch. Okay, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it is actually. Uh, not squared. Yes. So, there we go. Okay. So, we've got our x squared plus a squared coming there. And then we've got to actually figure out our x, y, and z components. So, um, how do we do that exactly? We have to look at the angle because we've got the cosine of this theta is going to give us the x component here. So cosine theta is what in terms of my geometry there? Somebody just tell me what cosine theta is. Think about it. Yes. Okay, great. It's a over r, and we know that r is square root of x squared plus a squared from the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to multiply that x squared plus a squared by another term. But, but let's write this out explicitly. So we've got db x component now. So the first step to this was just writing the general expression for my db. I didn't break it up into x, y, and z components yet. Now I'm breaking it up into x, y, z components. So I do that, and then I have... This is going to be db cosine of theta. And I know what db is already, so I just write that out. Mu naught over 4 pi i dl cross r hat. And then I just have this factor, this x squared over a squared, plus another square root of that. So then this just becomes to the three halves. And then we have for I D, I, uh, DL cross R, that's just going to be A on top. Okay. So then what about the Y component of this? We also have a y component that I can write, um, basically, I could do it, I could write it down below. So we have dby, that's going to be db sine theta. 
BB sine theta. And what is the sine theta going to be? It's going to be, if it was A over R for the other one, it's going to be what for the other one? X over R. Great. So then we can do that same process. We've got mu naught over 4 pi I X over X squared plus A squared to the 3 halves. So now we have our x and our y components. But what about our z components of the field? What are the z components going to be? They're going to be 0 because it's always lying parallel. So there's no b perpendicular component in the z direction. So we don't have to worry about um, the z component because we remember when we learned our rule before with magnetism there's no uh, magnetic field parallel it's only the perpendicular component yes so that that goes that drops out because when we're taking the cross product we actually get our that's where we get our dl it's basically r sine theta and r cosine theta comes from that depending upon whether we're talking about the x or the y components of the um, yeah so it comes from the cross product essentially so then we've got our total B field actually has only an x component because what happens is all of these y components that are going different directions in, in one place they're going up and the other place they're going down they're going to cancel out along the y-axis because of the symmetry of the problem so we actually don't have a y component of the magnetic field either we only have an x component of the magnetic field so then all of the uh, perpendicular components cancel and only the x components survive. So now to find the to the x component of the total field, now we're going to have to integrate this equation including all of the dl's around the loop because everything except the dl is constant and we can take it outside of the integral. So since the field point is not changing, our distance x and our distance a can also be taken outside of the integral. We don't have a change in current. I is constant. Mu naught is constant. The only thing that we have in there that's not constant is this DL. So then we have to sort of finish this uh, expression. So let's write this here. So we have mu naught over 4 pi, and then we've got our I ADL over our x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves integral of DL. And the integral of DL is very easy to see. It's just going to be 2 pi a. So then, finally, we have our dl. Sorry, I wrote that. It should be there. OK. So we have our dl. And now we have everything that we need for our integral. We just take the integral, and this just becomes a squared because there's 2 pi a and then there's a 2 pi here so the pi cancels we just have this so then we've got our expression for the total magnetic field only going in the x direction for this magnetized ring it's cause a magnetic field to be there because of the current flowing 
And we can see the direction of this for the loop if we have the current flow. Yes, question. Yes. Why the two thetas are equal. So for this for this drawing here where we have the blue um, where we have this blue sort of let me use a different color of chalk here for that. I just got some new chalk. So I can write this out. Oh, broken though. Okay, so we've got this BY component here going up like this. And then we've got our BX component going like this. DBX say dby and then we've got db going here db which is the sum of those two would be the sum of those two components if the by wasn't canceling so the question is why is this theta equal to this theta here so you can sort of see we have two right triangles here so right triangle here and then we have a right triangle here as well and so these right triangles are connected by a line here and it's almost like you could think of it as this triangle is sort of like a slightly rotated version of this one but they're sort of since they're in the same plane like this connected here geometrically we can show that these these triangles are adjacent in a way where this angle is equal to this angle. So that's that's where it comes from because there's two right triangles here. Okay. So the right hand rule for the magnetic field produced by the current in the loop. What is that? We have to take our fingers of our right hand and we have to curl them in the direction of I. So in this, this here, we're curling our fingers in the direction of I. And you can see that I'm given the answer of this magnetic field going in the X direction. If, it's, if the current's going the other way, we reverse that and it's into the board in the negative x axis. And then, yes. Um, when I used the right hand rule or when I did the, when I solved the problem. Um, it's it's given to us by the vector identities, so I, it does it's not something that I just assumed that I just knew. I had to sort of break everything up into its x, y, and z components. The only thing that I the only um, the only part of the field that I knew was going to be zero, where I didn't bother to do too much with it, was the z axis because we know that the z axis, the magnetic field is just there's nothing there at all. And then we had to do a little bit of, of geometry, trigonometry, to, to break up the, uh, the rest of it into the x and y components using the cosine and sine uh, identity and knowing that to know that we would actually have, um, you know, the direction being positive x for that. Because we could get a negative sign, right? If the current is going the other way, then this the sign of the dbx is going to change, and we're going to have we're going to have a different um, a different answer because of that. It's just a matter of writing out the Biot-Savar law in its full form and then breaking it up into components. Um, and when we come when it comes to doing this, we're going to have um, we're going to have a lot of practice. That's why in the discussion sections for this. I want you to, to work, spend a lot of time working with them on understanding how to do this 
geometry where you take the cross product and you turn it into trigonometric expressions. Because I understand that that's not that's not uh, easy. That's probably one of the most the probably the most challenging part of doing this kind of problem. So definitely invest some, a little bit of time in that as well. Yes. Um, you know, you know what? Let me go back to that so I can explain that a little bit more. So there's actually, I actually meant to write that there. I'm sorry. I, um, I sh there should be a DL there the whole time. So let me, let me go ahead and rewrite this. So it's not dB cosine theta. There's actually going to be, um, the dB actually still has a DL in it too. So it's mu naught over 4 pi DL and there's there's still a dl here so let me see i'll just put that in here like that sorry about that yeah so yeah and you can see that here in the notes so we don't we did not lose the dl the dl is stays but what happens is the cosine of our angle and the sine of our angle is what takes care of the cross product so we still have idl but then when we look at taking the actual angle here, that's where we get cosine theta and sine of theta. All right, so good questions. So now we have our derivation for the uh, circular current loop. Now what we need to do is we actually have to sort of figure out what about for if we have more than one loop. And it's simple. Because of the magnetic field being linear, the field just adds the same in every, in, in every loop that we add. We just add in another uh, contribution from that loop. So if we have a whole bunch of coils wrapped together, it's just going to be n times our expression along the x-axis going as an axis going out from the center of the, the, the loop. And this is important because in a lot of applications, like MRI machines and things like that, we want a really strong magnetic field. But it, if we, to increase the magnetic field, there's a couple ways we can do that. We can increase the current I, but then there's this problem where if the current is too high, it will actually cause, destroy the wires. So in practice, we can only use currents of certain uh, magnitude. We can't use too much current. So a better way to increase the magnetic strength if we need a really strong field is by having a larger number of current loops. So we can do an N multiplied by this expression, and that gives us the result for any number of current loops. Say if we have like etc cetera, etc cetera, 15 loops then we have a nice expression that tells us exactly how much field we have based off of that so this is a really useful result for calculating the magnetic fields uh, due to like solenoids and things like that and then we can actually look at the magnetic field strength as a function of X it doesn't fall off um, linearly. It actually, the way that the field goes, it's maximum at the origin, and then it tails off on either side. So what you're looking at here for this, this uh, graph, you're actually looking at the center of the loop, the current loop, and you're looking at how does it, how does it fall off with distance x. So it's maximum here, and then it falls off as I move outward this way or back into the board, and it's, it's equally with equal distance. I saw a hand. Yes. 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 Uh, so you're saying that if the distance, sorry, say that again. Uh, 
Oh, uh, that's a good question. So you're saying, what if the spacing of the loops is not even, and things like that? That's a that's a complication that we won't uh, worry about in this. That would be something that you might see like in a little bit more advanced. That would change the result a little bit. I wouldn't say that it would be. You'd have to figure out because basically what you're saying then is, you know, you you're not. It's not completely symmetric, right? The contribution of each loop then is going to be is going to be a function of where you are spatially. Because if you're closer to the one loop and a little further from the other, I mean, even in this case, this this is going to be a little bit less accurate when I have a really long solenoid. So we're thinking about for the case where we have a lot of loops wrapped around really tightly close together. We have this, this result, and that's the magnetic field that, and we're, we're going to actually see this later in a demonstration. You'll see the, the effect of this. Okay, so we also have a magnetic dipole going on here. And we talked about the magnetic dipole mu. Uh, I know it's unfortunate that we have to use the same symbol as we do for the permeability of free space when they're two completely different things, but that's just how it is. We run out of symbols pretty fast. So just know that we also have this magnetic dipole, also known as a magnetic moment, for the current carrying loop. And we found that that was IA, where A is the cross-sectional area of the loop. And then, so if there's N loops, we have a total magnetic moment NIA. And so we know that the, uh, the area of this loop that we have now is pi a squared. So the magnetic moment for one of these single loops is i pi a squared. And then for n loops, its mu is n i pi a squared. So we can also write this magnetic field in the x direction from this current loop or set of current loops, solenoid, as being due to um, this magnetic, in terms of this magnetic dipole. And this is on the axis, along the axis of any number of circular loops. There's one important point that I want to make here. Um, this isn't, this, this expression that we have here, we only did this for a field point at P. Remember, this, this solenoid, we could, we could have picked any other field point anywhere in this uh, region and while in a lot of places it would be it wouldn't be anything because it would cancel like along the z-axis or the y if we picked some part that was like a portion of the x-axis then it would be different than this result it would only be like the portion of if, if it was like maybe say going like diagonally here along x and y it would be a little different than this result because we'd only have a portion of the magnetic we'd only be seeing the magnetic field in part of our region that we're looking at so remember that this derivation is specifically for a point along this x-axis when we're oriented like this um, I'm gonna keep things pretty straightforward I'm not interested in tricking you or confusing you like on an exam giving you one where this is like a Y instead or something like that but just keep that in mind because you'll see it if you're if you're taking an exam or something you have to know that this result is true for this specific geometrical situation at this field point but it could vary and be different if we're say at um, oriented differently Yes, there was a question. I think I saw a hand. No? Okay. So then, this is our result if we write this in terms of the magnetic dipole. Okay, and then, yeah. So here's the sort of picture of what one of the dipole or one of the loops looks like so you can see we have this current I and you can do the right hand rule here and you can see the direction of the B field as we're going around so in this plane when the when when my hand is here you can think of it as on along your desk you can see the B field going around like this but then as I go upwards the B field is going in a different direction 
it's going around like that. So that's, it's important to know that you're, we're dealing with a very complicated situation where we have a B field that is spatially varying. It's different, but it reaches some sort of a, you could think of it as it's a steady current, so it reaches some sort of static configuration where the X component is the only thing that survives because the Y components cancel and there never was a Z component. But it just shows the power of using a little bit of symmetry. We can actually get a nice expression for a very complicated case. All right, let's do an example. Read this question over really quick and see if you can work this based off of the equations that we just used. Okay, so we've got a coil consisting of 100 circular loops with the radius of 0.6 meters carrying a 5 ampere current. What's the magnetic field at a point along the axis of the coil 0.8 meters from the center? And then what is it along the axis? At what distance from the center of the coil is the field magnitude 1 eighth as great as it is from the center? So we have our values that we need to plug into our equation. So this is pretty straightforward. We've got that the component along the x-axis is going to be mu naught times the times 100 because that's the number of current loops we have times the current itself, 5 amperes. And then we've got the radius uh, squared. And then all of that over 2, and then we've got our x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves, where our a is 0.6 meters, because we're looking for a point uh, 0.8 meters from the center. So that's, where the, that's our x distance there. So if you got that, congratulations, you got the correct answer. Um, now what about for part b? For part b, we have to sort of turn this around in reverse. We want, we say, along the axis, at what distance from the center of the coil is the magnitude one-eighth as great as it is from the center? So first, we need, we need a value that's um, at the center. And so at the center, x is just zero, and we just have a. So then we have to sort of solve for that um, and they did this a little bit differently than I would do it. They sort of skipped a couple of things over. So let's, let's sort of draw this, write this out a little bit. So really what they're saying is, at what point is dBx um, one-eighth this? You could, you could just look at the one over x plus x squared plus a squared terms, but the reason that you can do that is because the rest of this is constant. So mu naught is not changing. This, this part of the is, this, is the same for both the origin and the 1 8 fall off point, wherever that is. So really what they're doing is they're writing this equation out twice. And they're just saying, OK, OK. And then x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves. That's going to be equal to 1 eighth mu naught over 2 i a squared n over 
x squared because a to the 3 halves because a squared a is 0 this is the point at the origin point at origin so this is the point where the b field is largest b field is largest here and it's only one eighth of this at this point so now we have to solve for that and then we can go through and we have x so we have an equation for x um, where we can take the reciprocal of it and then take it to the two-thirds power so that's a little bit of math um, basically you're just you know multiplying both sides to get it to the same and then you're gonna we're gonna solve for x and we get since it's a square root we're gonna have two results so that's consistent with what we would expect from our plot so here I have two results and I say does that make sense that it's plus and minus and then it does make sense actually because if you think about it here we have a plus and a minus so at it, that corresponds to different points along this plot somewhere along here there's a plus and a minus place where the field strength has dropped off to only be one eighth what it is right at the center okay Okay, here's a conceptual example that I think will help people understand. Let's, let's look this over and see about what is the magnetic field produced at a point P by a segment DL that lies on the positive Y axis. So this field has components dBx greater than zero, dBy greater than zero, and dBz equals to zero. What are the signs of the components of the field dB produced at P by a segment DL on the negative y-axis of the loop? Sorry, I know there's kind of a lot of um, print here. So we can just, just break this up into two different pieces, piece by piece. And I actually want people to um, talk about this amongst your neighbors a little bit. So get out a piece of paper, draw the situation out and think about it for a minute and discuss and then I'll put it on the board too and we'll work it to make sense of the geometry since there was a lot of questions about the cosine and the sines of the angles when I was doing it and I and I left the little DL off by accident this will help you understand this uh, problem a little bit better
Okay, so as you can see here, I've drawn this, I've drawn this sort of picture so that you can see the geometry better. Um, so we've got this R, R hat. This is the key, right? We've got, we've got our expression for the BO sub R where we have this DL cross R. So really what tells us the direction that things are pointing in is this DL cross R. This DL cross R. And there was a lot of question about what does this give us? Well, what it gives us, what it tells us is we have to find the components that's perpendicular to this field, this vector field. We have to find its components. So we have, we have DL cross R. That's going to be the same thing as finding its cosine and sine of this angle. And if we look at this region here now, the part where we're looking at along the y-axis, the negative y-axis, you can see that the x component, which is the sine of this angle, is pointing this way for this segment. And why is it pointing this way? Because that's the direction my r hat is pointing in. r hat is pointing from here to my field point P. r hat is pointing here from my field point P. So whenever you're figuring out how to break up these little bits of magnetic field contributions for my shape into pieces, you always want to be thinking in terms of where's my R hat pointing to my field point, and then breaking that R hat up into components and seeing how those components add or subtract. Here along the X axis, sine theta, they add because they're both going in this direction. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. But then look at the cosine component. Here, the cosine component points downwards. Here, it points upwards. That would be my dBy. But then the dBy just becomes 0. I didn't write all of the rest of this expression here, so I'll just leave that off because I ran out of space. So what ends up happening is we only have a contribution from here. And now you can see that from me picking a different field point along it. And then if I picked a point along Z, there's no contribution even at all because there's, there's nothing given there that's just zero. This, there isn't even any, any way for me to connect it to that point. Whoops. Okay. So, and that, 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 go, that coincides with our result that the B field is zero along the axis where we have, not along the axis, but along the point where we're parallel. We want the component perpendicular to that. We have no perpendicular component at all for the Z case. Okay. So I hope that helps a little bit. I understand the situation is a little bit complicated. There's this, maybe is your first time seeing this. It takes a little bit of practice to get the hang of going through and breaking this down into steps. But that should help. So now we can go over the answers step by step to the conceptual questions. Okay, so for part A, what are the signs of the components of the field DB produced by P along the negative Y axis? We just answered that question. And then part B, what are the components of the field produced at P on the negative Z axis at the right side of the loop? So then we actually see here that we have for a segment on the negative y-axis, dl equals minus k hat dl points on the negative z direction, and r is x i hat plus a j hat. Hence, dl cross r is a dl i hat minus x j hat, which has a positive x component, a negative y component, and a zero z component. For a segment on the negative x-axis, dl equals j hat dl points in the positive y direction and r ha is r vector is x i hat plus a k hat and so we have a uh, a dl i hat minus an x dl k hat which has a positive x component zero y component and negative z component so that's interesting so they got an, a very uh, interesting result for that point so, um, but you can sort of see how the y components here cancel and we only have an x component. Um, 
I think for this drawing, though, they picked a different field point than what I picked a little bit. I guess it's because of the geometry of it oriented. Interesting. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go over Ampere's law now. There's a better way, actually, oftentimes, than the Vio Savar law to find the magnetic field. And it's called Ampere's law. And it's related to the line integral of a magnetic field. So a line integral is when uh, we have a general line as our coordinate that we want to integrate a function along. And typically, in calculus, we're always integrating along with respect to the x axis. But you could use any general line that you want to. And when you want the line to be a curve, like a circle or even a sphere, you'll want to use line integrals. So um, <coughs> basically, we have this situation where In calculus, you always learn to integrate some function, f of x, could be a curve, could be a line, whatever, along the x-axis, dx. And what that says is it says, count up the value of the function with respect to my x-axis. So I'm going to get some value here by integrating f of x, dx. And we always just say it's the area under the curve. But really, what it is more precisely is it's the value of the function with respect to this axis. That's really what that means. And then what it is is since we count up the value of the function along from here to like this point here from 0 to p, we're counting up the value of functions all along this line and it's the sum of all of those. But I can make this this region as small as I want and I could make it a point and then I'm just finding, I'm just saying, hey, what's my value of my function with respect to this axis? You can do the same thing, though, with a vector field. I could have some general curve, and I could say, what's the value of my vector field? So now I have a more complicated function, like a b, it's a vector of x. And I could say, it's a function of some direction. And then I could, instead of taking dx and saying what's its value along some straight integration axis, I could make this my integration axis. And I could say, I want to count up what's the value of my field with respect to this circle here. So your dl is your x, it's like you took this axis and you bend it around, and then you're not integrating in 1D anymore. You're usually integrating in 2D or even 3D. And you're counting up the value of a vector field that lies along that axis. So that's what a line integral actually means. It's very different than a normal standard integral. But it's the same idea. It's just it's different in that instead of you know having this case where the line doesn't change it can change it can be whatever curve you want it to be this could be a valid integral as well a valid dl so now for ampere's law we can actually write this we're going to be doing this we're going to be taking the the line integral um, of a function a vector field and this is the symbol for a line integral. We have the little circle. And this is always going to be for a closed path. So you can do line integrals where the paths aren't closed, but that's not valid for our analysis. The path, it's always going to start and end at the same point. So that's what that, you could think of that little circle meaning closed path. So um, you've seen line integrals before, maybe, to calculate work and to calculate electric potential. Um, so to evaluate this integral, we divide it, the path into infinitesimal segments, dl. And then we calculate the scalar product for each segment and sum all of the products. So what do I mean by scalar product? 
That's the dot product. So we find the component of this vector field that lies along this, this axis here. And a lot of this, for this example, some of it's going to be positive and some of it's going to be negative because I have like, say I have a line going here too, right? There's going to be some component of this where there's a dot product that's not zero. There's going to be a contribution to this. So all of these vectors going through here give me a contribution to my integral, a value along that. So I find a value of my field with respect to this axis. It's just a little bit hard to see because we have a flat board, but really this integral is sort of in a uh, 3D space because we could have the vector field going up, down, wherever, and we're counting up its contribution with respect to that axis. You could think of the, the circle as being on the ground and the vector field is above that circle maybe even. Yes, question. Um, in general, n not necessarily, but in what, what we'll see. When we have it written in terms of angles, perhaps, yes. We can, we can use angular polar coordinates sometimes. That's a good question. So yes, in, in certain cases, if we're using polar coordinates, then we may be integrating through an angle. Um, so the basic idea of Ampere's law is, let's consider the magnetic field caused by a long straight conductor carrying a current I. And we found this uh, in, in section 28.3, the field at a distance R from the conductor has this magnitude B. It's mu naught I over 2 pi R. So the magnetic field lines are circles centered, yes, oh I, thought I saw a question, sorry. The magnetic field lines are circles centered on the conductor. We take the line integral of B around a circle with radius R, and then at every point on the circle, B and DL are parallel, and so B dot DL equals B DL, since R is constant around the circle. So here's a picture of that. So you can see that uh, the integration path is a circle centered on the conductor. The integration goes around the circle counterclockwise. So we have uh, B dot DL equals mu naught I. And the B vector is counted up along that. And then in this case, we're not going to have to worry about doing polar coordinates. We just we know that the magnitude of the field is constant, it's B, so we can take it outside of the integral, and then we just count up the, all the components of it along this axis, and we know what, how to calculate what that axis is. It's just the 2 pi r. So the integral of dl for this circular case with the current going in this, it's, it's two, or with the uh, b, sorry, not current, with the b going along is 2 pi r. And then we have a 2 pi r in the denominator, so then we have the, in the integration path for this first path in the vicinity of a straight current carrying conductor carrying current out of the plane. So there's a dot there in the middle. So we've got the current going out, and we've got the B field going around. So you can see that with the right hand rule for current. You've got your finger pointed out, you've got your B field going around like that, and then we're counting up all of the B field that lies along that path, doing the integral DL as 2 pi r. And then we get mu naught i as a result for that first case. Now, what about if we do the same integration path, but we go in a circle that's counterclockwise? So we're going, we still have the B field going in the same direction, but DL is going in the opposite direction. So it's, it's sort of like we're just taking the limits of our integral and flipping them. We're, we're, we're reversing the direction that we count along. Before we counted in the same direction as the B field, now we're counting as the, in the opposite direction. So which direction you go in for the, the path integral matters. It, it changes the result. So we have that B and DL are now anti-parallel, so B dot DL is equal to minus B DL. So we get the result that it's now equal to minus mu naught i, and it's a reverse direction. So thus, the Ampere's law gives us that 
we have mu naught multiplied by the current passing through the area bounded by the integration path with a positive or negative sign depending on the current relative to the direction of integration. So if the if sign is negative, the current's going in the opposite direction, or the B field's going in the opposite direction of DL. Yes? Uh, yes, I could. So this one? Yes, no problem. Okay, uh, what's your, so what's the question about this slide? Oh, okay, um, okay, no problem. So I'm gonna I'm gonna post these um, slides as well. I thought that I did, but I guess I didn't. So tell you what, let's um, let's take a 10 minute break. I'll post the slides, and then we'll do some uh, some cool like little demonstrations. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions about the quiz. I'm just gonna go ahead and make an announcement. I know not everybody's back yet, but we'll just get started um, talking about. I'll just address a few questions that I've been getting a lot. So um, as far as the quiz goes, it is going to be based directly off of the homework. There's not going to be, there's going to be different numbers for the problem maybe than what you saw in the problem, but it's going to be the same exact thing because the whole point is um, if you attempt the homework, even if you get like a 60% on it, if you go through and you tried to solve the problems, I think that you should get full credit for the homework. I don't agree with the system of punishing you for attempts. I think that's a, a terrible learning strategy. I like the mastering physics problems for the most part, but I think that it's, a, it's, it's misguided for them to punish you and test you over something when it's homework. You're supposed to be learning. You're not supposed to be getting graded on something as you're learning it. That's stupid. You're going to get full credit for all of the homework that you do. If your homework score says 75% at the end of class, make that 100%. That's what your homework grade is going to be just for attempting it because that's the right way to do it. And I want people to be encouraged to try and experiment and think about these things even if they make mistakes because that's a better learning environment. And then the idea is you do the homework and you get, um, you get a much better understanding of the problems. And then the quiz comes, and you get a, a chance to demonstrate your mastery of the homework style problems through that quiz. So it's going to be based directly off the homework. Now, the exams, the midterm and the final, they will also have some problems that will be sim somewhat similar. I am going to probably write my own problems for the midterms and finals. So don't expect carbon copies. However, it will be very fair. I'm not going to expect you to do something way more advanced than what we did in class or something like that. The conceptual aspect is important. It won't just be math problems the whole time. There will also be conceptual questions to see if you can just look at a situation and sort of figure out what's going on. Um, and then depending upon how the first midterm goes, I may make some adjustments to the second midterm based off of that because this is the first time I've ever written an exam for a large class like this. So I'm inexperienced, so I, I would assume that I will probably gain some insights into um, uh, the process as I'm going about. But I will say this. I took a lot of classes. I had a lot of different professors, and I was always paying attention to what worked and what didn't. The biggest mistakes I saw was I had a beginning professor and they, they had, this was their first time teaching like a statistical mechanics class. And they gave, um, the first midterm was just like stuff that they didn't really teach and it was really hard and like the whole class basically failed it. And so the whole class was just kind of scratching, the, we were all scratching our heads wondering what was going to be next. And so I learned, that was an example of like what we don't want to do. So we, I don't want to give you problems that are not like, that or give you concepts and things that we didn't talk about. It's got to it's got to be based directly off of what I'm teaching you and just sort of a mastery of what I've done. And that's sort of like my mindset for designing the quizzes and the uh, midterm and final. It's 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 going to be try to be as fair as possible and reward the learning process because um uh, I really want physics education to improve. I don't like the way that science and physics is being taught and being done at the university level right now. I actually did not completely enjoy being a physics PhD student. I, there were, I love physics and I loved the process, but there were a lot of things I didn't like. There was a lot of professors that I contacted who didn't 
want to talk to me about their research who are kind of not cool about that. I really don't like that. I don't like how physics professors today, they stay in their little bubble and they don't ever want to venture out of it. I don't like that. I'll always tell you about my research if you're interested. Come to office hours. I didn't like that they didn't have enough office hours. I felt like there wasn't enough engagement going on. So I'm, I'm also interested in like improving that situation because I want the funding for physics to improve. I think the funding situation is terrible. Out of people who get PhDs in physics like me, almost none of us get to be physicists. That's a disaster. Okay, imagine, imagine going to medical school and putting in like 10 years of work and then you can't even become a medical doctor afterwards. You learn all of this information and you don't even get to put it to use. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace of our system and we have to change that because that's what's going on right now. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of that, but like out of the people that I went to graduate school with, almost none of them get to even teach physics. Most of them are working in like, um, like for a company doing like financial analysis or coding or something like that where you don't really even need a PhD in physics. But I guarantee you that none of them went through this huge process of doing it with that expectation. So it just goes to show you that there's a huge gap between what we, what we as physicists want, especially our generation, and what we're actually getting, and it's a disaster. We have to change that. So this class is about creating a positive uh, learning experience for everybody and teaching you a lot of physics in the process. Okay, so with that being said, I think everybody's back now. So I just want to jump into oh, the, the lecture. Uh, the slides are now posted. Um, and so you can follow along on Brew and Learn. Um, oh, yeah. Also, these lectures are being recorded now, so you can watch them later, too. So let's sort of finish up this Ampere's Law uh, section. And then let's do some, uh, some little demonstrations, some demos. That'll be pretty cool to see. OK. So, oh, sorry if that was too loud. Um, so we have the magnetic field, and we're sort of counting it, its value, along this path, this DL. And so we get this result when we go in the same direction. When B is going in the same direction as DL, it's a positive result. And when it's going in the opposite direction, it's a negative result. Why is that so important? Because current can, co can go two different ways. So if I had a current going into the page as well, an X or a couple of currents going into the page, I'd have, I'd have um, other integrals here with different signs. And that's why we're, we're paying special attention to that. But there's one more point I want to bring about, which is that you can actually show through a little bit of geometry that if my, uh, in if my integration path lies outside of my current, so like say I have like a, a current here and then I have some integration path, it's just some random path and it doesn't enclose the current, then this integral, this, this path integral, B dot DL is just going to be zero. There's no contribution. And so you can see that because we have this circular arc AB of radius R1, and then B and DL are parallel, and B parallel is equal to B1 mu naught I over 2 pi R along the circular arc CD of radius R2. B and DL are anti-parallel for the other path, so you see they have the four different integrals drawn out. And then we have B1 from B to A DL plus a zero contribution minus a B2 DL. So those two cancel. So even though we get a contribution from the uh, first and the third for the two different Bs along that path, those two different paths, we actually have a net zero result. And this will be true for all of time. So you can just remember, whenever you have a current that is missing an integration loop, a loop that's missing a current, you're not going to have a contribution to the Ampere's Law equation. So it's going to give you a zero result. 
So um, the conclusion here is that for these different integration paths, we have that the line integral is thus independent of the radius of the circle and is equal to mu naught multiplied by the current passing through the area bounded by the circle. So that's a sort of another, another fact about it that's independent of this. If you, it doesn't matter how big of an integration path you draw. This is kind of interesting. The fall off, the fall off in strength exactly equals the um, exactly equals the distance of the integral. So in other in other words, in other words, b dot dl. If I have some current here, it's doing something. If I draw one integration path and I do b dot dl, that's going to be equal to a bigger path like this. And that's not that's not super trivial, right? Because is the dl the same? No. The dl for this one is much larger. So why is it that these two are the same? Why is it that this one and this one are the same uh, value for b dot dl? It's because b falls off exactly the same as the distance when we move outwards when we do this integral. And that's kind of incredible. It's amazing that we have some this magnetic field obeys such a precise law of nature that we can just like draw this out on a sheet of paper and be like, oh yeah, the B field, yeah, it's just going to be decreasing as we move outward on this piece of paper. There's like, that's like a very profound thing if you think about it. It's very interesting. And then we can also uh, derive these results for more complicated integration paths where you don't have a circle and you have all of these angles going on um, and then we have this b dot dl is bl cosine phi um, but it doesn't matter so even with these complicated integration paths you still get mu naught i as the final result so it doesn't even matter if you have some squiggly line <sighs> This b dot dl is the same as this one. So that's very interesting. And then if we miss it, what's this one going to be? It's going to be 0. OK, now we have our multiple currents. So for multiple currents, we have this perspective view, an arbitrary closed curve around conductors. You curl your fingers of your hand around the integration path. Your thumb points in the direction of the positive current. And then you can figure out um, basically your contribution for that, doing it that way. And then if we calculate the line integral of the magnetic field around a closed curve, the result always equals mu naught times the total enclosed current. No matter, see here, they didn't draw any specific path. It's just some general curve. Uh, it wouldn't just, it wouldn't be something easy like 2 pi r to calculate that. You'd have to do a lot of analysis. But it doesn't even matter. We don't, we know from the derivation that we just count up the current. So i enclosed is just i1 minus i2 plus I3, and then in line integral b dot dl is mu naught i enclosed, where this is the scalar product of the magnetic field and the vector segment of the path. That's our b dot dl. And mu naught is permeability, magnetic constant, i enclosed, net current. And then, um, so we're, we're going to get 0 for this because we have i plus and i minus, so the net contribution is 0. OK, so let's do, um, let's do an example problem. So we derived Ampere's law from equation 28.9 for the field of a long straight current carrying conductor. Let's reverse this process and use Ampere's law to find B 
for this situation. Okay, so think about what I'm asking here. I'm saying we, we derived Ampere's law for the field of a long current carrying conductor. Let's reverse it and find B now. See if you can do that based off of what we did. So the first thing to think about is we've got cylindrical symmetry. So Ampere's law, we can take our integration path to be a circle with radius R centered on the conductor and lying in a plane perpendicular to it. So um, there's, a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a caveat here. So when I did Ampere's law for the currents carrying conductors, we're just assuming it's just like a very uh, symmetrical cylinder. If I do Ampere's law for like a cylinder where the current can actually move about a volume, that's a little bit different. That's a little bit more involved because I'm not just, I'm not just taking like a simple wire and finding and, and, and integrating around it. It's a little bit more complicated if I'm actually looking at like portions of the wire inside because a cylindrical conductor is essentially just like a giant wire where the current is going to flow on the outside of the conductor because that's how metals work. The property of metals is such that the valence electrons are free to move about. Most of the electrons are bound to the solid, but the lattice, the metal, is regular enough that electrons are, their movement is supported so they can freely move about. Okay, so we pick an integration path and then we use Ampere's law to get our result, mu naught i. And what we can say then is we can figure out that it's B is mu naught i over 2 pi r. Because since Ampere's law determines the direction of B as well as its magnitude, if we chose to go counterclockwise around the integration path, the positive direction for current is out of the plane. So this is the same as the actual current direction in the figure. So I is positive and the integral B dot DL is also positive. So there's one more thing to know about this with Ampere's law. Actually, let me go back one more. I want to spend like one more second talking about this. So we have that the DLs run counterclockwise and then the direction of B must be counterclockwise as well. Okay. So you, when using Ampere's law, if deciding if that's what you want to use, it's the easiest to use if the magnetic field D is tangent to an integration path and has the same magnitude at all points along the path, which is exactly like the case we have for a wire. Because with the wire, if it's out of the page, the B field is going to be tangent to any circle that we draw. There's going to be lots of tangential components there, so it's really easy to do that path integral. Okay. Um, before I do this example of Ampere's law, I kind of want to do some uh, demonstrations. But let's see. Maybe we'll skip this one, and we're going to do a different. We're going to do a different one, uh, and then we're going to come back to this one because the one that's after this, we're going to actually. Sh I'm going to actually show in the demonstration, and this one's a little bit long. Okay, let's do this one first, and then we're going to do some dem some demos. Okay, so we have a solenoid. This is a, a, a helical winding of wire. The spacing of the wire is, is the same, and it's usually circular in cross-section. And you can see what the B field looks like for that. It's got, it's got a different direction to it, depending upon whether we're inside or outside of the wire. This is only a portion of the, of the solenoid. That's, a, that's like a cutout of it. It's actually circle, like a full circle. But you can see here, at the center of the solenoid, it's going to be a straight line almost. And then the magnetic fields are going to be curving around at, at the exterior points. And the B field curves around and comes back because there's no magnetic monopole. They're all dipoles. So any field lines that exit have to re-enter at some point. So if the solenoid is long in comparison with its cross-sectional diameter and the coils are tightly wound, the field inside the solenoid near its midpoint is very nearly uniform over the cross section and parallel to the axis. So the external field near the midpoint is very small. 
Use Ampere's law to find the field at or near the center of such a solenoid if it has n turns per unit length and carries current I. So we're going to assume that B is uniform inside the solenoid and zero outside. So we can see the situation for our chosen integration path um, here. So here's our integration path. So we're going to choose this path inside the solenoid. And we know B is zero there, and B has some value in the central part of the solenoid. And then what do these little dots and X's represent? It represents the direction of the current out here and into. So the current's going like this. It's a, it's a circle. It's going up and around, up and around, into and out of the page. So then alongside AB, this path here at the bottom of that drawing here, so AB is right here, okay? B is parallel to the path and constant. Our Ampere's Law integration takes us along the side AB in the same direction. So here B parallel is, is positive, and we have B dot DL is just BL. And then along sides B and C, BC and DA, B is perpendicular to the path, so B parallel equals zero alongside CD. B is zero, and so B parallel is zero. So for the entire path, the only part that contributes is the first side B that we did, BL, the side AB that gives us BL as the result. Okay, so in length L, there are NL turns, each of which passes through A, B, C, D, carrying current I. So the total current enclosed by the rectangle is this I enclosed, that's NLI. So then the integral is positive. And then from Ampere's law, I enclosed must be positive as well. So this means the current is passing through the surface bounded by the integration path, and it must be in the direction shown. So then we get BL equals mu naught NLI, and then we solve and we get the field of the solenoid. B then is equal to mu naught NI, um, which is very a very interesting result. So it's also interesting to note that that side does not have to be on the axis of the solenoid. So it demonstrates that the field is uniform over the entire cross section at the center of the solenoid's length. So we have this uniform B field at the center of the solenoid. Yes. So that comes with our, our formula that we had from before for a wire, circular current loop of wire that we did before the break. So I'll go back to the slides here. And we had a um, circular current loop. Where was it? Yeah, here we go, N N L. <coughs> Let's see. Okay, yeah, we have N, we have this N contributing here from the certain number of loops. So, yeah, N is the number of coils in the solenoid now. So we have... In this case now, we have the solenoid having the number of turns. So N will be the number of turns in the solenoid. Okay. So then there's a picture of what it looks like as you go outwards from the solenoid, from the origin, along an axis of minus from a to minus a and onward so um, and I'm gonna show we're gonna show what this looks like now um, for the case of uh, a current if we direct a current through various current loops we're gonna see we're gonna actually visualize this magnetic field now okay so um, one quick question before we do this um, if you see this accompanying figure, we're going to have a current. Which way does the needle deflect if it's placed on top of the circuit as shown? So think about this. In which orientation, A or B, should the battery be placed in the circuit? Um, 
so that when the switch enclosed, the compass needle deflects, deflects counterclockwise. Because what's going to happen is a compass is a magnet too. So when we, when we close a circuit and we create um, a current, we're going to create a magnetic field. And then the compass is a magnet too. It's going to respond to the magnetic field. And what's going to happen is, just like with the magnetic field of the Earth, the compass is going to respond, and the net and the north pole of the magnet is going to of the compass is going to be repulsed by the north pole of the magnetic field caused by the current, just like it is for the Earth. And it's going to be attracted to the south pole. So think about which direction that's going to go in. So it, with this case, the orientation will cause current to flow clockwise around the circuit. Okay, so it's going clockwise around the circuit. And then, thus, the current will flow south through the wire that lies under the compass. For the right-hand rule for the magnetic field produced by a long, straight, current-carrying conductor, this will produce a magnetic field that points to the left at the position of the compass, which lies atop the wire. So the combination of the northward magnetic field of the Earth and the westward field produced by the current gives rise to a net magnetic field to the northwest. So the compass needle will swing counterclockwise counter to align with this field. So there's, there's actually a slight contribution from Earth's magnetic field because the magnetic field caused by the, the circuit is not the only contributor for the compass. It still has the Earth's magnetic field influencing it as well. So it's the, the combined effect of those. OK, so now I want to take a break here and I want to do a couple of demonstrations to show you um, some cool effects for uh, for what happens to the so here we have iron filings and these are these are been, have been around for a long time these iron filings actually um, Michael Faraday did experiments with iron filings and there was like a big debate about what's going on with the inside here. There was a big debate about what was a magnetic field really was, and so um, he demonstrated that there really was a field ever present in space that was causing this effect. Because a lot of scientists didn't think that was the case at the time. They thought that the magnetic force was just like any other force, where it's like a contact force, where if like I push on this desk. The force is just right here. But he was he was sort of like, no, the force isn't just right here. It's all around, and it's only responding in this one area. But that doesn't mean the force isn't everywhere. And I have to be careful about my phone because some of these magnets are pretty strong. But anyway, the filings were there, and they were important because the filings are a way to, pr to put tons of little microscopic magnets. Each of these iron filings is a tiny little magnet that's going to respond to the magnetic field. So what do I have here? I have current copper wire, and I haven't turned on the apparatus yet. But what you're going to see is these iron filings are going to respond. And this one is kind of hard to see. Um, you have to really tilt it over to get it to move around. But I'm gonna. I want it to be as random as possible, because I want this to respond to when I put the current. Okay, so let's see what happens to this. These little magnets when I get a current going on here. Let's see if there's a response. Keep watch the screen to see. Okay, so yeah, so you can see that circle. See how that circle formed? I can't do it for super long because the wires heat up. Does everybody see the impact on... Oh, sorry. It's a little bit off-aligned there. Does everybody see the impact of this? Let me do it one more time so that you can see the effect more. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm just completely randomly making the iron filings there, and then I connect it to the current, and then you can see. See how they're aligning themselves in that circular direction corresponding to the wire there? Okay, let's do it for a different, a different thing. Let's do a circular, a circular current loop. Okay, so we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna see what happens. Whoa, look at that. That's pretty cool. You see that? That one's much better. 
So you can see how, let me do that one more time. Okay. So you can see the, these magnetic fields are looping around these wire, these wire windings and producing a magnetic field here. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay. So then let's do it for the solenoid. We just talked about a solenoid and what we would expect to see a solenoid give us. So everything is totally random. The, w the, the filings are just kind of everywhere. What about when I have the current there? Can you see that? Look at that. No longer random. So we have these... Let me make sure you can see it really well. See how it's going through there? The magnetic field is roughly constant, and then it comes out. It almost looks like water flowing out of it. You see, see the close-up view of it there. There we go. One more time to see. Give everybody a chance to. So we're going to erase that pattern as much as we can. Okay, so all the all the most of the filings are down at the bottom. Now I put the connect the current and there we go. And then it's not it's not necessarily strong enough to pull the ones at the edge back, but the ones that are there you can see are aligned now with the solenoid. Okay. So that's that demonstration. So now we have um what do we have if we have a magnet? This is just like the example we just did. So I'm going to connect this, and I'm going to see. Oh, you see that? There's a torque there. So everybody watch. Uh, if you can't see this, you're welcome to come down and get a better view of these uh, experiments. But basically, when I connect this battery and I create a current flowing, we get this. The magnet is torqued. So there's a magnetic force causing it to orient due to the current. So you can see that effect there. Okay, and then what about this one? Let's see. There we go. That's a strong, a very strong effect there. So we've got going this way. And then finally, we've got this one. There you go. Jumping wire. So can we actually, can we actually do this with the right hand rule. When we're going when we're going this way, right? Q V cross B, we're gonna have a force because the wire is going this way and then the magnetic field is pointing actually this way from south to north. So we should be getting we should be getting uh, a force going this way. So why is it going why is it going this way? when we should be getting when the magnetic field because QV cross B is going into the page because it's going because the magnetic field always goes from south to north why is it the wrong way when I do the right hand rule what's the difference here yes because it's negative it's not positive so whenever remember with the right hand rule when we have protons if this was a proton current somehow then it would be in going this way but since it's electrons it's negative so it's out that way Oh, you see that spark? Yeah, I can only do that for a second. Okay. All right, cool. So physics works. We demonstrated the uh, power of our analysis, that it actually is relevant. Um, you're welcome to come down here and try these for yourself. Just be careful. Only click it for like a few uh, seconds. And then let's see how much time we have left here. I don't know if we have a minute... Okay, we've got about eight. We've got about eight minutes. You know what? I don't think we have enough time to do the one example. Um, there's an example on the slides, but um, so we'll call it for today. But um, if you want to, you can uh, come down and try these. 